All right, we have a lot to do today, in addition to the quiz during the break. In Lecture 5A, I'm going to show you how to make graphs in Mathematica, and that will be helpful for thinking about some transformations of graphs. Then we'll look at a quadratic function some more and introduce the idea of a derivative, one of the big ideas in calculus. And I'll probably carry over into Lecture B, more on derivatives, and then we'll talk about log rules. Okay, so a hodgepodge of topics here as we review pre-calculus content. Let's start with graphing in Mathematica. So if you don't have Mathematica installed yet, you'll want to do that tonight or tomorrow because like I told you a few minutes ago before we started the video, there will be something to do with Mathematica for the assignment due Friday. I've shown you how to use the solve command. Let's show you how to graph a function like a quadrat. Okay, a basic kind of graph can be made with plot, capital P, L O T. And again, as with all mathematical functions, you want to use square brackets for the input of this mathematical function that will produce output that is a plot. Okay, these are functions too, just like our functions in calculus. They have inputs and they have outputs. The inputs and outputs are not numbers. The inputs are, you know, expressions and the outputs are either answers to equations, solving equations, or graphs. This is going to produce a graph as output. We can, for example, plot the graph of x squared. Put a comma, say x goes from negative 5 to 5. So there is a fairly simple bit of syntax that produces a plot. Do take note that there needs to be a comma there. There needs to be commas here and here. There need to be curly braces or curvy braces around the x comma negative 5 comma 5. Okay, that's Syntax is very important in Mathematica if you use it in the standard way. There is a, there's a free form version where you don't need to be careful about syntax. It's more like Wolfram Alpha in that sense. In fact, Wolfram Alpha is made by the makers of Mathematica. That'll make a plot. There it is, of x squared. Okay. And you can double check that it goes through some of the right points. For example, when x is 0, y is 0. When x is 1, y is um, the next is one which is right there, y is one which is right here. The scales you can see has been picked to be different on the axes. So on the x-axis one is right there and the y-axis one is right there. You can make an adjustment to make the scales look the same, but this is good enough for the moment. When x is 2, y is 4. If you go up to this point here, y is 4. When x is 3, y is 9. Go up to the graph right about there and go over to 9. Okay, so you can see the graph of x squared. If you want, don't like the Y range that it picks, picked, you can adjust it. You can pick a different Y range. And what you do is you uh, you might want to write this on a different line. Put another comma in here, and then type plot range, capital P, capital R, arrow, make an arrow with a minus sign and a greater than sign. And then I'm going to make another one of these lists that has curly braces, and some numbers separated by columns in it. Watch what happens as I start to type that. That arrow with the minus sign and the greater than sign will come to look more like an actual arrow. Here we go, ready, one, two, three. Yep, turned into a regular looking arrow, like magic. And maybe you prefer looking at uh, the plot range to be, say, negative 50 to 50. This is the plot range in the y direction that I'm picking. Like that, okay? So you can modify the plot range. You can also color the graph to make it, for example, look thicker and maybe some different color. I can do another comma, uh, plot style, capital P, capital S, arrow, and then inside curly braces, maybe thick, comma, red. We will make it thick and red. So again, pay attention to details. You put commas between things. Particular kinds of code needs to have capital letters. Plot style needs to be capital P and capital S. Put the arrow with a minus sign and a greater than sign. Then in the curvy braces, put thick and red, and we'll make it thick and red. There we go. Okay. There's much, much more you can do with it as well, but this is good enough for starters. However, so the, I'm going to have you probably for next Monday make some plots. Not for Friday, but for next Monday. Um, uh, there's something else I want to show you today. 
that's going to help us understand transformations of graphs a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and just copy and paste this whole thing. So I'm about to do a control C for copy and control V for paste. By the way, I've said this before, when you want to enter code, you do need to make sure your cursor is on the same line, the same cell essentially that you see over here, before you hit shift return to do the entering. I'm going to embed this in another function. It's one of my favorite functions, it's called manipulate. Manipulate, I gotta spell it right though. And remember, as with all mathematical functions, it needs square brackets around its input. Its input, you can see, is this plot. See a little red arrow there, carrot. Why is that there? Mathematica put that there. I didn't type that. Mathematica is saying, hey, I want something else. What else should I put there? Well, it depends. Depends on the situation. What I'd like to show you before we go back to the PowerPoint here is one way to visualize transformations of graphs. I changed that x squared to an x minus h quantity squared. What is h? h is going to be a horizontal shift, right? When you replace x with x minus something, it shifts the graph to the right by that amount. When you replace it with x plus some positive number, it shifts the graph to the left, that's sort of amount. I'm not specifying here initially whether h is positive or negative. It could be either. Let's take positive values of h so we shift it to the right. If I just enter this as is, it'll give me an error. It's not, it's not complete, not where nothing happens. It needs to know what I want to do with the h before it's going to produce output. Put a comma and then h comma say 0 comma 5 inside curvy braces like that. That's telling Mathematica now let h increase from 0 to 5. Just like with the graph, x went from negative 5 to 5. Here I'm going to let h change from 0 to 5. And what it's going to produce is an animation. We're going to see the graph for different values of h as h keeps getting bigger. So we should see the graph shifting, shifting to the right. Horizontal shift. And you can either play it by sliding the animated the slider yourself, like that, or just playing it. And this is the kind of thing you sometimes see in my PowerPoint slides of where I make these animations like this. So you should see as h increases, the graph shifts to the right. H is the horizontal shift. I'm going to show you more of this kind of thing on Friday, but just wanted to introduce it today. Manipulate can animate pretty much anything, actually, in Mathematica, not just graphs. There's lots of different things that I can animate. Like, like you remember the very first lecture, how I animated like uh, the cars and the, and the bath that we're filling with colored water and the population growth of the bacteria or something? Um, I was using Mathematica and manipulate for that. That's a little introduction to graphing and mathematics. Let's talk quadratic functions and ultimately derivatives here. <coughs> uh, this slide is the last slide from Monday's class. Yet more on quadratic functions. We introduced quadratic functions on Monday. Remember I said they're not one-to-one -one over their entire domains. Why? They failed a horizontal line test. Why they fail the horizontal line test? Can anybody describe why they fail the horizontal line test? The graphs are parabolas that look either like this or like that. Why do those fail the horizontal line test? What is the horizontal line test? One to one. It, if it passes it, it's said to be one to one. And why are these not one to one? There's two coordinates that share the same x value. There's two coordinates with the same y that uh, have different x's. Yes, shows different x values. Like, for example, yeah. say f of x equals x squared. It's, it's easy to not quite say it, right? There's two points on here. 
for example, at the output 4, both the inputs negative 2 and positive 2 give you an output of 4. And that horizontal line at y equals 4 passes through the graph more than once. And if that happens, that means it fails the horizontal line test. It's not one to one. Here you have two separate numbers that get mapped to the same one number. You might say it's two to one. Since two separate numbers going to the same number. So it fails the horizontal line test. There are lines that go through more than once. But we can maybe restrict the domain. Consider just half the parabola or something like that. If we restrict the domain appropriately, we can it can become one to one. Like I just said, restrict the domain so the graph is just half of the parabola, for example. Put in the quadratic form the functions formula in vertex form is the most convenient way to do this. I'm going to look at an example. We're going to look at the example actually that I of the answer key for that physics problem that I shared with you. And I'm about to show you again here. Yesterday. You gotta be careful what the inverse function is though. You gotta think about the domain you pick. Because that's gonna become the the range of the inverse function. You gotta think about that kind of thing, it's kind of tricky. So here's our free fall example. Uh, in non-standard units, okay, this is in feet. Don't use feet in science classes, okay? But it makes the numbers come out a little nicer here. The height of an object. This object is going up and down. Its initial height is two feet, about this high off the ground. Maybe it's like a, a tennis ball shooter or something, pointing straight up with a tennis ball in there. Its initial upward velocity, it turns out, is this 96 feet per second. So it's going pretty fast, right out of the cannon. And this negative 16 is really Negative 32 over 2, where 32 is the downward acceleration due to gravity. Feet per second per second. In meters per second per second, it's 9.8. But in feet, it's 32. 32 divided by 2 returns out as 16, and you need a negative sign here because it's a downward acceleration. On the upward path, when will the object reach a height of 100 feet is the question. Use an inverse function to answer this question. You don't, you don't have to use an inverse function. Answer the question that I'm trying to emphasize inverse functions. So here's a picture of the situation. This is the height versus time. The graph is going to look something like this. It is a downward opening parabola, concave down, because the coefficient of t squared is negative. 2 is the h intercept. And 96, like I mentioned yet on um, Monday, is the slope of the graph at t equals zero. The rate of change, the derivative of the graph, there's the slope of this line that I made, which is called the tangent line. Slope equals 96, that line that kind of follows the graph right there. This is in feet. Technically, the slope is in feet per second. 100 is up here somewhere. This picture is not to scale. Not a very accurate picture. Okay. We're trying to find where on this upward path, what time do we reach a height of 100? By the way, the motion is straight up and straight down. It's not, it doesn't have a horizontal part to its motion. This is not a graph of the height versus horizontal distance. It's a graph of the height versus time in seconds. The motion is actually straight up and straight down. That's what I would imagine. So the entire graph is now one to one, but if we are focused on the upward path, we should focus on this half of the parabola. That half, if you ignore this half, is one to one. And we have an inverse function. And if we plug 100 into the inverse function, we should find the time that we need. That's the big idea. So a quick overview of the method. Complete the square to put the formula in vertex form. So I suggested watching Khan Academy videos about this if you don't remember how to do it. 
It is something you should know how to do for the exams. If the coefficient of t squared is not 1, which it's not here, it's negative 16, you should factor that out of the first two terms. Now, I picked 96 here because 96 is divisible by 16. If I had picked a different number, like 100, for example, then the number right there would not have been so nice. But I purposely picked 96 to make the number. 16 times 6. And in factoring a negative 16 out, the coefficient of t squared right there becomes positive 1. The coefficient of t there becomes negative 6. So when you multiply that negative 16 back through, you've got to get this. Leave the plus 2 out there. And here's the method. Once you've done that, take the coefficient of the t, which is negative 6, divide it by 2, and square it. Say that again. I want to write that down. Take the coefficient of t, negative 6, divide it by 2 to get negative 3, square that to get positive 9. Okay, I probably should have. Negative 6, divide by 2, you always divide by 2, whatever it is, square to get 9, and then Put the 9 in there, inside the parentheses, plus 9. Wait a minute, is that allowed? It is allowed as long as you compensate for adding the 9 in there, which really means you're compensating for adding negative 16 times 9. You're really subtracting 144. 16 times 9 is 144. So to compensate, I need to add 144 on the outside, like this. there. That compensates for the plus 9 there with the negative 16 there. Negative 16 times positive 9 is negative 144. I need to cancel that by adding 144 here. You may be used to doing this on the other side of the equation. And there is another side of the equation here. It's the h. I could have subtracted 144 from the h. But then I had to add it to both sides anyway. Since I'm trying to have h as a function. Although, it might have been better to have it on the other side. I misspoke, actually, because we need to solve for t anyway. Question? Um, why do you have it on the outside of the parentheses? Oh, 144, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Um, I'm putting it out there to compensate for the subtracting 144 because of negative 16 times positive, positive 9. I want to put it out there because I want to combine these constants to get the 146. It's going to turn out that when you use this method, this thing will always be a perfect square. Because in fact, if you think about it, t minus 3 times t minus 3. It's t minus 3 squared. And that tells you that this vertex, the high point of this parabola, must have coordinates 3, 146. That's why I want the 144 out there. So that when I combine it with 2, I get 146. And it's the second coordinate of the highest point in the graph. Why? You should be able to answer why. Give an explanation. If this were like a graded problem or if you were on the exam and I ask you, based on this, why is that the highest point of the graph? You have to explain. Here's how I would explain. I'd say, hey, well, no matter what t is, t minus 3 squared is greater than or equal to 0. We're not dealing with imaginary values of t here. So we can't get a negative number when we square. That means negative 16 times t minus 3 squared must be less than or equal to 0, no matter what t is for all t. And the biggest it could possibly be is 0 when t is 3. Therefore, coming back here, this function is always less than or equal to 146. And the biggest it can be is 146 when t is 3. Okay? This part must be less than or equal to 0. And it equals 0 when t is 3. Therefore, this entire thing must be less than or equal to 146. And it equals 146 when t is 3. It's got to be the high point in the graph. 
And as far as restricting the domain goes now, this part of the parabola is when t is less than or equal to 3. So that's what I want to do as far as restricting the domain to find the inverse function. Restrict the domain to the set of all t where t is less than or equal to 3 and solve for the inverse function. Solve for t is a function of h and don't, do, don't swap the variables. That would be a bad idea because they mean something here. t is time, h is height. Solve for t. So I do end up, actually I, I end up putting the six, negative 16 t minus 3 squared on the other side as a positive and subtract h from both sides and then divide by 16. I did a couple steps there. Say it again, I added 16 t minus 3 squared to both sides to get it over on the left side and cancel it on the right. And then I divided both sides by 16. I also subtracted h from both sides. I guess it's three steps that I did from here to here. t minus 3 squared, I want to solve for t, I need to take the square root. Square root of this is the square root of the top divided by the square root of 16. The square root of 16 is 4. I also added 3 to both sides, so I did a couple steps there. And I picked the minus square root. Why did I pick the minus square root? Why not the plus? It's because of how I restrict the domain of the original function. If t was less than or equal to 3. I want a t value less than or equal to 3 here. I better have a minus sign now. If I put a plus sign, it would be bigger than or equal to 3. That's why I put the minus sign. Then you plug h equals 100 into that, and the answer is about 1.304 seconds. And here's a way to uh, graph it. You can graph it either way. So this is the original parabola right here. h is a function of t. When does h equal 100? It equals 100 when t is about 1.3. In terms of the graph of the inverse function, notice that I'm not graphing it in the same picture because I want to keep the meaning of the variables the same. h represents height, t represents time. I did relabel the axes. Now t is a function of h. And if you graph that square root function, it looks like this. You can try it on the calculator. I'd suggest trying that on your calculator after class. You'll see a graph that looks like this. When h equals 100, t is about 1.3. It represents the answer to the problem. <coughs> Just different ways of viewing things. Inverse functions are useful. For example, logarithms are inverse functions, as we'll talk about in lecture B. And they're useful. Okay? They're useful for problem solving, problem solving tools. This is what I shared with you on Google yesterday, an announcement, you got your email. I'm going to go on to the next slide. We're going to start working our way toward the idea of a derivative here. Okay? Let's first talk about some limits. We've talked about limits already. If A is positive, I'm talking about your arbitrary quadratic here f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c in standard form. If a is positive, the graph is concave up and looks like a u, u-shaped parabola. The graph goes up forever and ever, right? Goes up forever and ever. The outputs are going off to infinity, plus infinity, as x goes to plus infinity or minus infinity. You can write this. The limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity is plus infinity. And again, I'll say it again, just because I put an equal sign there doesn't mean I'm treating infinity like a number. It's just convenient shorthand notation, that's all it is. And remind yourself what this means. By the way, this concept of what this means is something you should know for the first exam. Something I'm emphasizing in class. What does it mean? It means it'll get above any horizontal line you pick, no matter how high it is, eventually, if x is big enough to the right or to the left. For example, take f of x equals x squared. I could ask the question, how big should x be to 
positively or negatively. You can be big and positive if you're far to the right of zero. You can be big and negative if you're far to the left of zero. Positively or negatively. To make f of x be higher than, say, o a million, 10 to the sixth. <coughs> It's just a matter of solving this inequality and seeing that the logic goes, goes both ways. f of x being greater than or equal to a million is equivalent to x squared being greater than or equal to a million. Take the square root of both sides. Hmm, this is a little tricky here. Technically speaking, the square root of x squared is not x. Did you know that? Wait, what? Isn't that true? Aren't they equal? Now, if x is negative, they're not equal. Technically, it's equal to the absolute value of x. Tricky, tricky. Whether x is positive or negative, that's what you want to think about here. This is equivalent to the absolute value of x being greater than or equal to the square root of a million which is 1,000. And that is equivalent to either x itself being greater than or equal to 1,000 or x being less than or equal to negative 1,000. And this logic is reversible. So if you want to get above a million, then pick x to be either bigger than or equal to 1,000 or less than or equal to negative 1,000. Then you can say this is true, then you can say this is true, then you can say this is true. But a million is arbitrary. I could have picked instead of 10 to the 6, I could have picked 10 to the 100. A Google. Square root of a Google, do you know what that is? Well, it doesn't have a name as far as I know, but it's 10 to the 50th. 10 to the 50th times itself, you can add the exponent and get 10 to the 100. By the way, a Google, 10 to the 100, a one with 100 zeros after it is more than the number of atoms in the observable universe. That's how big it is. More than the number of atoms in the observable universe. That's how humongous that is. But this function gets higher than it by making x greater than or equal to 10 to the 50th or less than or equal to negative 10 to the 50th. So this is arbitrary. You can do it for no matter how big you pick a number there. The, this is true when the function is x squared. It's also true in this general situation as long as the a is positive. Well, if a is negative, then we go off to minus infinity because the graph is a parabola opening down, upside down view. You can get lower than any horizontal line by making x big enough to the right or to the left. All right, now we get a little harder. What is the average rate of change of a quadratic, such as f of x equals x squared, over an interval? Say we start with a specific input x and increase it by our old friend delta x. After I show you this, then we'll take the quiz. We'll break with the quiz. Average rate of change, what's that about? Have we talked about that before? We did the first day of class, the first lecture. We talked about distance equals rate times time. And I said much of calculus is just a generalization of that equation. We're doing a little generalizing right now. That's equivalent to rate equals distance divided by time. And as, if you're going at a constant rate, this equation gives you your constant rate. But it gives you an average rate if your speed is changing. If you're going fast and slow and fast and slow and fast and slow. It gives you an average rate. That's what this is about, an average rate of change of a quadratic. In this case, we are taking the f of x equals x squared. It's, it's really a, a slope it looks like, doesn't it? Change in y or change in x. 
Change in y is the distance. Change in x is the time, say. But wait a minute, quadratics aren't straight lines. They're parabolas. This is not going to be constant. It will change. Depends on what x is. It also depends on what delta is. So what do you do with it? You calculate this fraction. The change in y is up there. There's the change in x. This is why we emphasize the skills test again, the placement exam. You should be able to deal with these, these kinds of symbolic things. The function's x squared, so I take whatever's inside the parentheses there, and I have to square it. Then subtract the function out, put itself x squared. Simplify. What happens when you simplify? You get this. So I, I use FOIL here. This is x plus delta x times itself. Remember, delta x just represents one quantity. It's not delta times x, it's delta x. x times x is x squared. x times delta x, another x times delta x, gives you two x times delta x. And then you have delta x, last times last, quantity squared. Don't forget the minus x squared over on the right. Now cancel. Simplify the x squareds, or, or cancel them. After you cancel those, what's left on top, each term has a factor of delta x that can be factored out, like that. Uh -huh. um, why did you multiply the end by just delta x plus delta x squared? Why did I do this? Uh, no, over to the left, uh, right there. Right here? Yeah, um, instead of just doing delta x squared. It's, it's not equal to delta x squared, is it? From the uh, O and I of FOIL, outside times outside, and inside times inside, they're both x times delta x. And you've got two of them that are being added. So you get two times x times delta x. All of them. Then divide out the delta x's. It simplifies to that, at least when delta x is non-zero. If delta x equals zero, then this is undefined. You can't divide by zero. That's nice. That's, that's pretty simple. Here's the calculus. Take this expression and let delta x approach zero. Take the limit of it as delta x goes to zero. What is it? Replace delta x with zero, and you, the answer is 2x. But wait a minute, I thought, I thought delta x can't be zero, because I'd be dividing by zero. This is the confusion of calculus. Why am I letting delta x go to zero if delta x can't equal zero over here? We can dispel this confusion. It's just got to be here for the moment. We need to take a quiz now, OK? All right, take a break. Take a quiz here.